Hello class. So for today, our topics are sulfonamides, trimethoprim, and quinolones. Our lecture outline is as follows. We'll discuss antifolate drugs, and then after, we will discuss DNA gyrase inhibitors. To guide us with our discussion today, we're going to have two cases. So for the first case, a 30-year-old male patient developed painful urination for the past three days. Past medical history revealed that patient may have allergies to unrecalled drugs. Due to the community quarantine, he opted to self-medicate with trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Uh, the code is TMPSMX. After taking two doses of TMPSMX, patient started to develop multiple skin and mucosal lesions as shown in the picture. What happened to this patient? The second case is a 25-year-old woman presents to you with three-day history of painful urination and flank pain. She also had fever, chills, and body weakness. Past medical history revealed she had four episodes of UTI in the past year and was treated with TMPSMX for all those four episodes by her mother. Urine analysis revealed many bacteria and 4 plus for nitrates. Urine culture was also requested. What is the empiric antibiotic of choice for this patient? So for our first topic, we'll discuss sulfonamides, one of the oldest antibiotics that we know and still use today. Sulfa drugs are one of the earliest successful antibiotics ever developed. It was introduced by Gerard Domac in 1935, was initially marketed as Pronvacil. It is structurally similar to your P-amino benzoic acid or PABA, very important for the formation of folic acid and eventually DNA. Physical, chemical, and pharmacological properties are produced by attaching substituents to the amido group or the amino group of the sulfanilamide ring. One of the most inexpensive antibiotics today is your sulfonamides. Let's discuss the mechanism of action of sulfonamides. But before we go there, let's discuss how important folate for bacteria is. Human and other mammals can get folate from exogenous sources like food. On the other hand, some bacteria must rely on endogenous sources like PABA, making it essential for purine synthesis and eventually DNA synthesis. Therefore, this is the one that we utilize for this drug. It inhibits the hydroterate synthase and folate production is halted. This drug is bacteriostatic when given alone. It inhibits both gram-positive, just as Staphylococcus species, gram-negative enteric bacteria such as your E. coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Salmonella, Shigella, Enterobacter, Nocardia, Chlamydia trachomatis, and some protozoa. On the other hand, Riquetia are stimulated to grow with this drug. It has poor activity against anaerobics, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa is virtually resistant to all sulfonamides. It is usually given in combination with trimethoprim or pyrimethamine. Please take note though that some bacteria depends on exogenous sources of folate. Therefore, they are not affected by this drug. Resistance patterns on sulfonamides are generally attributed to some mutations in those bacteria, resulting in the following. Overproduction of the substrate, which is your PABA. Number two, production of a folic acid synthesizing enzyme. That has low affinity for sulfonamides. And three, the lately we discovered for impaired permeability to the sulfonamide. And recently, antibiotic efflux is another mechanism where resistance pattern is attributed. In discussing pharmacokinetics, it's best to describe them in groups. No? The first group is your oral absorbables, second is your oral non-absorbable, and the last are your topicals. No? Oral absorbable sulfonamides are absorbed from the stomach and small intestine and has wide distribution including the CNS, placenta, and the fetus. Protein binding varies from 20% to 90%. It undergoes metabolism in the liver and excreted in the urine, therefore requires adjustments in renal failure. Ever since the inception of this drug, 
bacterial resistance continues to increase together with your time to print, therefore limiting their use in the clinical setting. Many strains are now resistant like your meningococci, pneumococci, streptococci, staphylococci, and gonococci. In the clinics, it is frequently used in combination with trimetoprim and only commercially available in some countries as a combination. Trimetoprim sulfamethoxazole is the drug of choice for pneumocystis durovici. Previously, this was called pneumocystis carinii, no? the most common cause of pneumonia in patients with AIDS. Toxoplasmosis, the one that you get from ingesting raw meat or from cats, no? and then no cardiosis. So for clinical uses for oral absorbable agents, sulfadiazine is usually combined with pyrimetamine as a first-line agent for acute toxoplasmosis. Sulfadoxin plus pyrimetamine it's marketed as fancy nadir, is only available in some countries. It's a second-line anti-malarial drug. So now let's go to the clinical uses of non-absorbable agents. Sulfasalazine so is used for ulcerative colitis, enteritis, and other inflammatory bowel diseases. Silver sulfadiazine, an ointment, is given for burn wounds for the prevention of infection. Please take note that when we treat burn patients, we don't give antibiotics right away. So we give up something to prevent the infection. In the back of this patient, to your left, is the ointment. No? It's a white substance. It's given generously on areas of affectations. Muffinide acetate are also used as burn wounds, but it can cause metabolic acidosis, and we don't like that in burn patients. Based on recent evidences, drugs containing sulfonamide moiety have uncommon cross allergenicity potential, changing the paradigm about this drug. The most common adverse effect or reaction of these drugs are fever, skin rashes, exfoliative dermatitis, photosensitivity, urticaria, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and urinary tract problem, presenting with crystalluria, hematuria, and even obstruction at neutral or acid pH. Uncommon but serious and potentially fatal side effect of sulfonamides or Steven Johnson syndrome. The others are stomatitis, conjunctivitis, arthritis, hematopoietic disturbances, hepatitis, psychosis, and polyarthritis nulosa. Now we can answer case 1, a 30-year-old male patient who developed painful urination for the past 3 days. Past medical history revealed that the patient may have allergies to unrecalled drug. Due to the community quarantine, he opted to self-medicate with trimetoprim sulfamethoxazole or TMP-SMX. After taking two doses, this patient started to develop multiple skin and mucosal lesions. What happened to this patient? Basically, this patient developed what you call their Steven Johnson syndrome, marked by multiple skin and mucosal lesions, as you can see in the picture. Now, let's go to trimetoprims. What's the mechanism of action of trimetoprim? Trimetoprim selectively inhibits the bacterial dihydrofolic acid reduct. This, complementing the action of your sulfonamides. So this is a bacteriostatic when given alone. This is high yield information. Trimetoprim or sulfamatexazole when given alone is bacteriostatic only. However, when you give them as a combination therapy, they are bactericidal. So, trimetoprim resistance are also attributed to mutations, no? And these mutations produce a surgical permeability over production of dihydrofolate reductases, production of an altered reductase with reduced drug binding. Now, let's go to pharmacokinetics. Given orally, alone, or in combination, well-absorbed from the gut, well-distributed even in the CNS, 
It is more sil lipid soluble than sulfamethoxazole and therefore has larger volumes of distribution. It is excreted in the urine and requires renal dose adjustments. Trimetoprim concentrates in the prostatic fluid and vaginal fluid. But better activity than some antibiotics in those areas. So trimetoprim oral is given for acute UTI. Adverse effects of trimetoprim because of its mode of action produces megaloblastic anemia, leukopenia, and granulocytopenia in some subsets of patients. No? Remember, these diseases are caused by your folate inhibition. So it's important to avoid them in patients with problems with those. Trimetoprim inhibits secretion of creatinine at the distal renal tubule, resulting in mild elevation of blood creatinine. Clinician must know to differentiate if, the, if this is secondary to trimetoprim or other modalities. And here are some generalities of your trimetoprim sulfamethoxazole combination therapy. The synergistic combination of these folate antagonists blocks purine production and nucleic acid synthesis, again making them very bactericidal. TMP SMX is a drug of choice for pneumocystis cervici previously known as her P. carinae uh, pneumonia in AIDS patient, toxoplasmosis, and nocardiosis. IVT MPSMX is an agent of choice for moderate to severe pneumocystis pneumonia, alternative for infections from MDR strains of Enterobacter and Serratia, Shigellosis typhoid, and the preferred alternative therapy for Listeria monocytogenes. Patients with AIDS and pneumocystis pneumonia have a particularly high frequency of untoward reaction to this drug. Now let's go to your fluoroquinolones. The most famous of these drugs are ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin. The earliest drug under this group is renalidixic acid, used for UTI. However, this drug wasn't able to produce systemic concentrations. Then after this, synthetic chlorinated derivatives were made like our ciprofloxacin and levofloxacin. These were originally developed because of their gram-negative aerobic coverage. But please take note that they also have gram-positive coverage as well. And these drugs are generally bactericidal. To your left are the structures of nanodixic acid and their variations in the other fluoroquinone. The mechanism of action of fluoroquinolones is that it blocks bacterial DNA synthesis by inhibiting bacterial topoisomerase 2, which is also a DNA gyrase, and topoisomerase 4. Inhibition of the DNA gyrase prevents the relaxation of positively supercoiled DNA that is required for your normal transcription. Resistant organisms appear in about every 10 to 7 and 10 to 9 population of the bacteria, especially notable among Staphylococci, P. aeruginosa, and Serratia marcescens. Mutation in the quinolone binding region of the target enzyme or a change in permeability is the currently accepted model of resistance patterns in fluoroquinolones. So now let's go to pharmacokinetics. It is well absorbed orally, distributed widely, long half lives of levofloxacin, gemifloxacin, and moxifloxacin permits once a day dosing. Impaired absorption when combined with antacids, divalent, and or trivalent cations. Therefore, it should be taken two hours before or four hours after taking any of the antacids, divalent, or trivalent cations. Most are renally excreted, requiring renal dose adjustment, except for moxifloxacin. So now let's go to the clinical uses of fluoroquinolones. It's used primarily for urinary tract infection, including those caused by Pseudomonas aeruginosa, unlike the previous drug that we've discussed, which has resistance pattern against Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Bacterial diarrhea caused by Shigella, Salmonella, Toxigenic E. coli, Campylobacter. Tissues, bones, and joints infections 
intra-abdominal infections, and respiratory tract infections, except for the drug norfloxacin. Ciprofloxacin is a drug of choice for prophylaxis and treatments of anthrax caused by Bacillus anthracis. Gonococcal infections, but because of the high rates of resistance in the U.S., it's no longer used there. Alternative to chlamydial urethritis or cervicitis, specifically her levofloxacin and oxofloxacin. This is a second-line agent for your mycobacterial infections. Meningococcal carriers, prophylaxis for bacterial infections in neutropenic cancer patients. It's acceptable for those cases as well. Respiratory fluoroquinolones are your levofloxacin, gemifloxacin, and moxifloxacin. Therefore, they can use in cases of pneumonia. Here are the known adverse effects of fluoroquinolones. The most common are your nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Occasionally, patients develop headache, dizziness, insomnia, skin rush, or abnormal liver function tests. Photosensitivity, specifically for drugs lomifloxacin and perfloxacin. QT interval prolongation in gatofloxacin, levofloxacin, gemifloxacin, and moxifloxacin. So therefore, patients suffering for it yeah, should be warned in using this drug. Hyperglycemia when given alone or hypoglycemia when given with oral hypoglycemic agents is observed for gatifloxacin. This drug may damage growing cartilage and cause arthropathy. Therefore, it is not recommended but may be used for patients below 18 years old. It should be avoided in pregnancy unless it cannot be treated by alternative drugs. Temporary to permanent peripheral neuropathy is also common and a new adverse effect discovered in this drug. So now let's answer case 2. A 25-year-old female patient presents to you with a 3-day history of painful urination and flank pain. She also had fever, chills, and body weakness. Past medical history revealed she had 4 episodes of UTI in the past year and was treated by the TMPSMX by her body. Urinalysis revealed many bacteria and 4 plus for nitrates. Urine culture was also requested. As the clinician of this patient, what is the empiric antibiotic choice for this? The answer is, you shift to fluoroquinolones and we use ciprofloxacin to be given twice a day for 7 days. You should instruct the patient to watch out for other side effects of these drugs and to repeat the urinalysis after 7 days. So for any questions or concerns or any discussions that you need to do, you may reach me at my email address listed there and my Twitter account. Don't hesitate to ask questions because for me, that's very important. So I hope you're all staying safe and healthy. Goodbye class.